Thank you for joining this edition of CMEOcast entitled Matching Treatment Options to the Patient, the Role of Botulinum Toxin in Patients with Spasticity. Dr. David Simpson has been kind enough to share his thoughts and insights with us today. Dr. Simpson is Professor of Neurology and Director of the Clinical Neurophysiology and Neuromuscular Division at the Icon School of Medicine in New York, New York. Our learning objectives for today's CMEO cast are to recognize the clinical manifestations of spasticity and to develop individualized treatment strategies based on shared goals, available treatment options, and patient-specific factors. Welcome, Dr. Simpson. Well, hello. Welcome to our educational CME activity. Uh, this is entitled Matching Treatment Options to the Patient, the Role of Botulinum Toxin in Patients with Spasticity. And I'll introduce myself. I'm David Simpson. I'm a neurologist, uh, professor of neurology at the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York City, as well as director of the Neuromuscular Disorders Division and the Clinical Neurophysiology Laboratories. Now, let's start with a clinical case, a vignette. This is Michael. He's a 19-year-old man with upper limb spasticity associated with multiple sclerosis diagnosed three years earlier. He's referred because his treatment with oral agents by his outside neurologists were ineffective and those included baclofen and tizanidine, in that not only did they not relieve his spasticity effectively, but they caused significant side effects, including drowsiness and weakness and sedation. Now, the spasticity is causing significant impact on Michael's quality of life, and he's wondering whether or not there are other treatment options that might be offered for his spasticity. And so to back up a bit, let's start with some foundational definitions of spasticity. We'll talk about the features of spasticity, as well as the different forms that spasticity can take. Diagnostic assessment, setting of goals and expectations, treatment options, and then we'll focus a bit on one of my areas of interest, which is botulinum toxin therapy. Now to start with the definition, the classic definition of spasticity, uh, originally from Jim Lance and then modified by others over the years, is that spasticity is primarily a motor disorder characterized by velocity dependent increase in tonic stretch reflexes, so-called muscle tone, with exaggerated tendon reflexes, resulting from hyperexcitability of the stretch reflex. And this is one component of the broader upper motor neuron syndrome. Now, when we think of the upper motor neuron syndrome, that is a much larger group of symptoms above and beyond just muscle tone. And it's caused by damage to the central nervous system controlling voluntary movement. Now, when we think of damage to the CNS, there are several things that occur. And if we divide them into two main groups, one is loss of connectivity to the lower motor neuron, and the other is loss of inhibition to the lower motor neuron. Now, the consequences of the loss of connectivity is loss of muscle activity with what are called negative symptoms, weakness, fatigue, loss of dexterity, sensory deficits. When we think of loss of inhibition, we have the flip side of the coin with paradoxically muscle overactivity. And that includes positive symptoms, including spasticity, hyperreflexia, clonus, co-contraction, spasms, and even the extensor plantar response. And as we'll discuss, the negative symptoms, other than rehabilitation therapy, we don't have great ways to repair the nervous system 
with therapy. On the other hand, the positive symptoms due to excess muscle contraction, there are treatments available, including botulinum toxin, as we'll discuss. Now, you'll find different studies reporting prevalence of spasticity from different etiologies, stroke, traumatic brain injury, MS, and the like. And this is probably an underestimate, this study by McGuire. But you can see that the numbers are still very large. Obviously, stroke is a major public health problem. And spasticity is frequently a consequence of stroke and these other disorders. Now, in the next slide, you see graphically different regions of the body that are affected focally with spasticity. And we can go from the shoulder adduction and internal rotation, wrist flexion, forearm pronation, the clenched fist, flexed elbow, and the thumb and palm deformity. And these focal deficits can be treated focally with therapy, including what's known as chemo denervation, such as botulinum toxin. We then look at the lower limb spasticity, and we see, for example, the equina varus posture, the foot plantar flex supinated and inverted, the striatal toe, knee extension, knee flexion, thigh adduction. Note many of these muscles are very large and may require high doses of botulinum toxin for treatment. Now let's come back to Michael, remember our MS patient with upper limb spasticity that was not responsive to oral therapy. And Michael is frustrated, you know, because of his lack of response to these oral therapies. We discuss the role of physical and occupational therapy. And then we consider the possibility of botulinum toxin therapy, which could be very effective for his upper limb spasticity. Well, what are the treatment goals? And Michael may have particular goals that could be very different from another patient with similar disorder. Well, symptom relief. Can we relieve his muscle pain, spasms, contractures, limb position? Can we relieve patient care and caregiver burden problems? How do we ease his ability to care for the patient? Dressing hygiene, positioning, transfers. These are considered passive functional gains, what we do for the patient. Then we have active functional gains, such as what Michael can do for himself, reaching, grasping, releasing. And then other goals like facilitating PT with stretching and splinting, delaying surgery, preventing unnecessary treatments with adverse effects, such as the oral therapies he was getting. Well, of course, this is a shared process of decision-making and treatment. We try to provide the best treatment with the best evidence and offer that to the patient and the caregivers. We incorporate the patient relevant outcomes and goal setting, monitor these outcomes, and over time, we can tailor our treatment to the patient's response, including compliance with therapy. Well, what are some of the treatment options for spasticity? Well, just because a patient has spasticity doesn't mean it must be treated. So for example, we wanna focus on the patterns that are most disabling and that require therapy. And what are the therapies available? Well, there's a whole variety of treatments we have available, including PT and OT, pharmacotherapies such as oral agents that we discussed, baclofen, tizanidine being two most common, parenteral therapy, injected therapy, including alcohol, phenol, botulinum toxin, and in some circumstances, even surgical interventions, such as in pediatrics with ankle procedures, such as tendon lengthening procedures. Now, if we move to botulinum toxin, this is a fascinating drug with a very interesting evolution in its history. And for example, if we start in the 17 and 1800s, the bacteria was identified, Clostridia botulinum. 
In the 1940s, the Department of Defense began doing research on its agent, particularly as its concern as a biologic weapon. And then the 50s and 60s, the complex was purified as a 900 kilodalton molecule. And then in the late 1960s and 70s, Dr. Alan Scott, an ophthalmologist from California, began considering treatment of strabismus, infantile strabismus, with muscle paralytic agents and came up with the consideration of botulinum toxin, a very creative and innovative approach, which was somewhat controversial early on, but Dr. Scott persisted and ultimately accomplished some very exciting results, ultimately resulting in FDA approval for multiple conditions. Now, when we're setting priorities for use of these therapies, we consider efficacy, safety, ease of use, cost, and access. In the American Academy of Neurology, we performed evidence-based reviews of the best literature available for the various formulations of botulinum toxin, at least in the US FDA, and came up with levels of effectiveness from A being most effective, C possibly, and even U with insufficient evidence, and then for various indications that we updated in 2018, one sees blepharospasm, cervical dystonia, upper limb spasticity, lower limb spasticity, with the different agents, with the levels of evidence supporting their use. And you can refer to this paper back in 2016. What are some of the clinical trial results that are available? Well, the level A, the highest level of evidence, is available in upper limb spasticity for the three type A's in the U.S. ABO botulinum toxin, Dysport, ONA botulinum toxin, Botox, and INCO botulinum toxin, Xeomet. A level B with less data for REMA botulinum toxin or myoblock. Now, the gains in the studies were predominantly passive gains. But active function, what patients could do for themselves, not necessarily demonstrated in the placebo-controlled studies. Now, here is a bit of a complex and busy table, but we and others have developed guidelines and dose recommendations for the use of various botulinum toxins in different muscles in the body, and one needs to individualize the dosing based on the patient, the severity of spasticity, and other factors. And you can refer to these publications. We see different muscles, different parts of the body that are referred to in these tables, which I won't go into in detail. Now in the next slide, you see a picture of the upper limb, both anterior and posterior view, with some of the muscles that are commonly injected with botulinum toxin, and you can see recommendations, for example, of the number of sites to be injected. There's variability based on the FDA labels and clinical experience and practice. But these are some general guidelines that one can use for injection. And of course, to target these muscles effectively, one generally likes to use localization techniques, whether it be needle EMG, electrical stimulation, or ultrasound as targeting to be sure you're in the correct place in the muscle. Now, what are some of the considerations in using botulinum toxin? Well, what are the best injection techniques? And we and others are doing studies to investigate this, but we generally recommend using at least one. What is the optimal dose, volume, and dilution of toxin? How many injection sites? What are these differences between different serotypes, A and B, or different brands of toxin? Are booster injections safe and effective? Because the labels indicate injections should be spread apart by at least 12 weeks. What about antibodies? There are certainly data showing that one can develop neutralizing antibodies. It's relatively infrequent, but certainly something we need to keep in mind. And of course, access which varies quite a bit based on reimbursement and certainly in different parts of the world. What about safety and post-injection care? 
This toxin has been around for decades. It has a very good safety and effectiveness record. And the main side effects are related to the expected pharmacologic effect of weakness. So for example, local spread when injecting around the eyes can cause ptosis. In the neck, dysphagia because of spread to neighboring muscles. There's rare cases of systemic spread resulting in generalized muscle weakness, respiratory compromise, and in very rare cases, particularly children getting very high doses, deaths have been reported. And this results in a black box with all the botulinum toxins in the label. Coming back to Michael, we do see that we elected to treat with botulinum toxin A, own a botulinum toxin, Botox. Here are the doses for elbow flexion, wrist flexion, the clenched fist, injecting the doses as you see here. And his outcome was actually very good. There was marked reduction in muscle tone at the elbow, wrist, and fingers. Michael reported reduced pain and reduced spasms, improved range of motion, and even some active functional gains with improved ability to lift and grip objects. The SMART goals, you will find that there are different ways of monitoring and measuring outcome. This is one approach that is available in the literature where one can individualize the goals of treatment to the given patient. Turner Stokes and others have provided nice guidelines in the literature on using SMART goals. And so with that, I will thank you all for your attention. I hope that this virtual presentation was effective, particularly in the COVID era where we're doing much of our work virtually. And should you like to access any resources related to this activity, one can obtain CME and CE credit through the web link that is shown here. And additional resources are also available through cmeoutfitters.com, who uh, helped to organize and provide logistics for this presentation.